Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Eco Organization and Cosmic Dawn session. So uh, the first talk will be by Dominic Ansey, who will talk about an update on the REACH experiments and its Bayesian data analysis pipeline. Dominic, you can share your screen. Cool. All right, can you can you hear me? Yep. All right. So I'll get started then. Mm -hmm. All right. Brilliant. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, so uh, my name is Dominic. Uh, thank you, Bart, and thank you to the organisers for giving me this uh, this chance to talk. Uh, I'm giving this talk today on behalf of the Reach Collaboration, um, just uh, giving a summary of the Reach experiment, uh, an update, brief update on the current status, with a particular focus on the current status of its uh, Bayesian data analysis pipeline. Uh, so REACH, the radio experiment for the analysis of cosmic hydrogen, is a global 21 centimeter experiment. And given I'm the first talk in this session, I should probably give a quick uh, summary of what that means. So um, neutral hydrogen has a hyperfine transition at 21 centimeters, uh, owing to the spin flip between the uh, proton and the electron, uh, which means that neutral hydrogen in the universe can absorb from or emit into the, the uh, cosmic radio background at that wavelength. Um, and the degree to which uh, to which that happens is affected by uh, a, a sort of, uh, an assortment of astrophysical parameters. That's things like uh, gas collisions, uh, the kinetic gas temperature, the presence of Lyman alpha radiation, to name a few. Uh, which means what you can do is if you can measure that degree of absorption from the radio background is we can use that to probe um, uh, the conditions of the universe between, uh, in particular, between the, uh, the epoch of recombination uh, up to cosmic dawn when the first stars formed and the epoch of reionization. Uh, and the idea behind a global experiment is to use a single, uh, a single antenna uh, with a very wide beam to measure the sky average of that signal as opposed to say an interferometer that would measure, uh, measure the power spectrum. Uh, and what we'd expect to see is um, a dip in frequency of uh, approximately uh, 0.1 Kelvin, uh, sorry, a dip in brightness of point, approximately 0.1 Kelvin in the frequency range of uh, approximately 550 megahertz, uh, which will, and the, the shape and depth of this, uh, this absorption trough will, um, can give information about the first stars and about, uh, about the properties of the universe in that time period. Um, so just to give a quick summary of, of REACH, um, this is, a, a, say, a global 21 centimeter experiment, uh, predominantly a collaboration between the University of Cambridge and uh, Stellenbosch University. Although the team uh, incorporates people from, from uh, quite a variety of institutions working on uh, assorted different subsystems of the experiment. Um, so the main philosophies that we've been trying to, to focus on with REACH is firstly, the experiment has been designed from the ground up with a Bayesian data analysis pipeline, which I'm gonna be discussing today uh, and a Bayesian calibration system in mind. Uh, and we're also trying to focus on using physics rooted and the physically interpretable models of, uh, of all our data so that we can understand for and particularly account for the systematics. And again, I'm, we'll discuss why that's important shortly. Uh, the other thing REACH is intending to do is we're intending to deploy uh, two different antennae, uh, a hexagonal bladed dipole, first of all, and a conical logarithmic spiral. Uh, secondly, to, um, in order to utilize the two very different um, responses of those antennae in order to try and help understand and compensate for systematics in the experiment. And again, I'll discuss that in more detail later. Um, we're going to be deploying into the Kuru Radio Reserve in South uh, in South Africa. Uh, the the experiment has got a prototype of the first antenna we're deploying. That is the uh, hexagonal bladed dipole, um, with the intent of of uh, deploying that in the field and starting the the preliminary in field tests in the early part of next year. Uh, okay, so. I say I'm going to be discussing the, the data analysis pipeline in, in the most detail today. Uh, to give a bit of background on this, one of the major challenges of um, global 21 centimeter experiments and indeed 21 centimeter cosmology in general is the presence of bright radio foregrounds. Um, so these are radio emissions at the same frequency of that uh, absorption signal, uh, predominantly from, from our galaxy, but also extragalactic sources that can exceed the signal depth of, of three to four orders of magnitude. Um, and therefore, proper accounting of these foregrounds is um, very necessary in order to, to properly detect the signal. Uh, so 
one of the primary ways you can go about this correction is to exploit the fact that those foregrounds are predominantly synchrotron radiation. And so you can expect them to be spectrally smooth uh, in contrast to the non-smooth signal. Uh, so in theory, if you fit, with, fit the foregrounds with a smooth function, uh, you will be able to extract the signal, which is what I, this, there's a simulation on the left here where I've uh, simulated observation data of, of a global experiment uh, and fit the foreground with a smooth fifth order log polynomial. And you can see uh, we're able to in, uh, recover the 21 centimeter signal that I injected into that simulated data uh, reasonably well. However, this is complicated by the fact that uh, any antenna that you use will have a pattern that changes with frequency and that chromatic structure distorts those bright foregrounds and introduces systematic uh, these systematic distortions uh, that are spectrally non-smooth. Um, and so uh, if you look on the, on the right here, this is another simulation where I used uh, a simulation of a chromatic antenna. This is a conical log spiral, which we intended to use, uh, and attempted again to fit the foregrounds with a smooth structure. And you see we get um, it's a sort of 10 to 15 Kelvin residuals uh, that overwhelm the signal and prevent us from, from recovering it. Uh, so. I've been working on developing a data analysis pipeline for each uh, to, to account for this. Um, and the way this works is because because we're focusing on a physical property of the sky on which to base the model and which to use the parameters, which I've selected the, uh, the spectral index, the power law of the, uh, the power law index of those uh, foregrounds. Um, and the way this works is we can subdivide the sky into some number of, of regions within each of which you can expect the spectral index to be broadly similar. So this, for instance, is the uh, division for six regions, more or less following the galactic structure. Um, and then for each region, we assign an unknown but uniform spectral index, which then form our parameters. Um, so we have six unknown parameters here. Uh, with that done, we can then take uh, a base map, say the Haslam map or a, a global sky model map, um, to uh, as our base, scale that according to these parameterized spectral indices, convolve the result with a, uh, a, a model of our antenna beam, an EM simulation of our antenna beam. And this gives us a foreground model parameterized by this physical property, the spectral index, that not only models the foreground, but also has the chromatic structure from the antenna built into it. Um, and what we can then do is, is fit that model to our data um, using a Bayesian nested sal sampling algorithm. We use uh, Polycord um, to then fit for those foreground parameters and our signal. Uh, the reason we use a nested sampling algorithm is because it gives you access to the Bayesian evidence, which quantifies, uh, broadly speaking, quantifies how well a given model fits the data, uh, which means we can use that Bayesian evidence to judge how many parameters that we need, given uh, depending on, on the number that gives us the highest Bayesian evidence. So just to show how this works, uh, this is applying this pipeline to that same simulated data set I showed previously. Uh, and we can find that uh, firstly, 13 uh, regions, so 13 parameters on the, on the sky gives us the highest, uh, highest Bayesian evidence and so is optimal. Uh, and we're able to recover that signal uh, fairly well from beneath those large distortions. Um, so that's that's the basis of the pipeline. So I'm now going to discuss uh, the current status of it and the, the extensions that we've been building in. Uh, so the first thing to note is the, the reason why we focused on using a physically uh, a physical property of the sky as the parameter base. And the reason that's important is because obviously the data that an experiment observes will change with time as the Earth rotates. However, because it's a, the parameter is a physical property, the actual value of the parameters fit for any given uh, observation time won't change. They will be the same, the same subdivision of the sky, the same parameters just rotated. What that means you can do is you can uh, split your data set into all its individual time bins. And rather than fitting the integrated data to a single model, you can fit each time bin of data to a corresponding model, all of which are parameterized by the same parameters and fit them all simultaneously feeding into the same, uh, the same parameter values. Uh, and this lets you exploit that change in the foreground to pin down, uh, pin down the foreground parameters and the signal parameters more accurately. And the way you do that is just changing the, the likelihood uh, uh, as we're discussing here. Uh, so just to 
number of simulations um, where I've scanned over total integration time and the changing integration time and the changing uh, uh, separation between time bins. So up in the top right is uh, just one time bin down to uh, 36 in the bottom left and then fit the averaged version and the, the, that data time average to a single model and in this time separated case that I've just discussed. Uh, and we can see that although it's not uh, enormous, there is a reduction in the, uh, in the uncertainties on the signals uh, when we use the time separated version. Uh, so you do pin down the signal slightly more accurately in most cases. Uh, but also if we look at the peak number of sky regions needed, um, we find that in the time, time separated case, we almost always need noticeably more uh, parameters on the foreground to get the optimal case. Um, the only exceptions to that are ones with uh, typically very few, uh, very few data bins in uh, uh, time bins in your data, which is saying that not only are we pinning down the signal more accurately by doing this, we're also pinning down the foreground parameters much, much in much more detail as well, which helps us account uh, understand those uh, systematics in much more detail. Um, there is one. Uh, uh, you can push this one step further as well, which is to also note that not only is the um, uh, do, are the foreground parameters unchanged changing time bins, they are also unchanged even if you use different antennae. And this is one of the reasons why Reach is uh, intending to deploy two very, very different antenna designs, say hexagonal dipole and a log spiral, um, because you can then take this one step further and uh, take data sets from the two different antennae simultaneously and fit those uh, data sets in the same fit to the same parameters. Um, so just to demonstrate how this works here, I've, I've done a simulation with, uh, of, uh, with uh, each of those two antennae that I showed on the previous slide. Um, this is so this is for one hour of integration with uh, 20 minutes between them. So three time bins here, 20 minutes apart. And we can see that when we fit with both antennae simultaneously, we produce a noticeable improvement in the signal recovery over using either of them individually, particularly with the hexagonal dipole. And we also um, we can also notice that when we use both antennas simultaneously, this difference in the number of parameters we need between the time separated and time integrated versions uh, is, is not seen, which means that we're actually exploiting the different chromatic structure of these two different antennae uh, to pin down the foregrounds um, as accurately as exploiting this earth rotation would. Um, so in my last few minutes, I'd like to discuss one final extension here, which is that to note that in all those the simulations that I've shown so far, uh, um, I've assumed there's known exactly uh, and just been fitting for, for the, um, uh, the radio emission of the sky. However, this is uh, hard to do in practice. There are a number of, um, a, a great deal of factors that can uh, change the antenna beam of an antenna in the field, um, varying soil permittivity, um, although a ground plane will mitigate that somewhat. Um, effects from not being perfectly fat, uh, flat, um, imperfections in the, in the construction. So if your actual physical antenna doesn't match uh, what you have in your simulation, for instance, and obviously there are ways to, to measure the antenna beam in the uh, in the field to a degree, but overall it is very hard to know your beam exactly. So the ideal case here would be to uh, not only fit, uh, not be able to not only fit for the uh, uh, sky uh, radio emission, but also fit for the antenna beam. Uh, so I discuss, got, uh, I show here two two ways you could go about doing that, which is firstly to uh, parameterize your beam based on a set of frequency dependent basis functions, and then. Uh, describe your beam as a weighted linear sum of those, or alternatively, you could just define frequency independent basis functions, something like, say, spherical harmonics, uh, and then give your beam as a weighted linear sum uh, where the, the weight is a frequency dependent function, uh, parameterized in some case. Um, so I'll give a, a, an example of, of doing the second case, which is uh, simpler to, to demonstrate, uh, where I've generated a, a mock simulation antenna beam uh, out of the first four um, m equals naught spherical harmonics, um, just parameterized uh, by these functions here, uh, generated simulated data set using that antenna, and then attempted to fit for it uh, for both that, that antenna beam um, with an eight parameter antenna model um, of just uh, 
gradient and, and intercept of the coefficient of each basis function and a 15 parameter sky model. Uh, and you can see that this is actually recovering your signal fairly well, uh, demonstrating that we can, this pipeline does actually permit you to fit for antenna beam in this fashion. Um, so this is the latest development in the pipeline. There is ongoing work in this area, um, but uh, I think I'm out of time there. So um, there are my conclusions. Uh, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Thanks, Dominic. Uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Yes, Joe. Hi, Dominic. I'm, I'm definitely not uh, an expert in this field at all. I found uh, the idea of, uh, yeah, essentially marginalizing over the, the beam parameters a great idea. Um, can you do this if it's time variable? For example, if the, the, the beam parameters are actually time variable themselves, right, because of temperature and stuff like that. Can Is that just another another parameter in the model you can insert? Uh, I guess it, this starts to become very high, very high dimension. <laughs> Potentially, potentially yes. Um, I have not got any. Um, that's not something I've I've tried doing, so I don't have any data on on that. Mm -hmm. In theory, yes. It's just as you said. It's it, it's adding additional parameters, and eventually you will get to the point where the, you have so many parameters that uh, yeah, um, yeah, that you can data can fit to anything. It. <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is theoretically possible, um, but. Um, because it's likely your beam in the field will change with time, right? For example, different. temperature is just a classic one, right? Yes. Like observing during the day or during the night. Um, and obviously you want all the data you can get, right? So if you can observe during yeah. the day, but if your beam is like 1% different yes. you know, than at night, this can swamp the signal, I guess, as yeah. well. So, so it's in theory possible that the way, the, the way I think you'd get around that would be to, to utilize this effect uh, as well. Uh, because you can uh, just, if you split the whole thing into... Uh, into every time bin of data and fit them all simultaneously, you, in theory, get additional data to a, to uh, allow you to fit additional parameters. Um, mm. So it, it so it is possible, but I'm afraid I don't have any uh, yeah no don't have any hard idea. data data on yeah. the results. Thanks, interesting stuff. Uh, next is Richard Shaw. Sorry, just get the microphone working. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe this is a, you know, a stupid question because, you know, this is a, a waste of my field, but where do you expect, like, polarized emission at very low frequencies on the sky to, to limit this analysis? If you have a sort of single dipole, do you, ex you know, do you expect to be picking up, you know, Faraday rotated spectral structure at some low level or? Um, it, it, yes, in, is, is the answer to that. Um, we, the uh, there are people in in the in the team that I don't have this data to hand, but there are people who are who are looking into the the effect of uh, um, of polarized emission on this uh, uh, in this experiment. I've not been accounting for it here. This is uh, these simulations are just um, using straight power. Um, the we there. Are, so so the the short is that it, the short answer is that it, it does. Uh, polarized uh, emission will will have an impact. It will add an additional layer of of uh, of modeling that you need to do. Um, in theory, you can uh, account for this somewhat by taking data sets where you've you know rotated the antenna mm -hmm. um, to measure the polarization uh, to measure the different polarizations. Um, it, it it does it does have a noticeable impact. I, I'm afraid I don't have uh, I don't have data to hand on the on the degree degree of impact though sorry oh thanks that was yeah interesting enough okay uh joseph Lazio, you have a question yeah it, it's first off nice talk really really need to see this this basic analysis uh, i'm not sure if it's a question or if i'm i'm sort of piling on joe callingham's comment of one could also worry about the sky changing joe mentions day versus night so is the sun an issue and then radio frequency interference will change the apparent temperature of the various positions of the sky as it comes and goes. Um, is, it, is it sort of the same thing that, yeah, it can be included and at some point there's the risk of, of overfitting? Um, I mean, yes, that risk is always there. Uh, so this, with regards to the sun, uh, that your data, your data set does not need to be one continuous data bin here. Um, so, 
uh, the intent is to, to sort of only uh, only observe at night um, and hopefully avoid avoid that that impact. Um, uh, with regards to RFI, um, always a challenge. Um, uh, I've I've not the, the simulations here aren't aren't including RFI, um, but. Uh, there's sort of a naive assumption that we've flagged and removed it all. Um, although, in in theory, um, you can you can flag a, a sub substantial amount of it. Um, I've not tested trying to fit for RFI alongside it. Again, yeah, you will uh, you will get to the point of uh, overfitting with just too many parameters, but. Um, hopefully, if you have data of the time variance, it should account for that to a degree. Okay, uh, thanks, Dominic. Uh, let's take the discussion to the Slack. Uh, next up is Richard Shaw. Can you share your slide, please? You're muted, Richard. Yeah, we cannot hear you. Better, I hope. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, thanks for for having me here. Um, yeah, I'm I'm Richard. I'm a you know postdoc at uh, well uh, UBC in Vancouver, um, where it is currently dark and quite late. Um, and I want to tell you about uh, some of the work we've been doing with Chime recently, although it's been going by a long time. Um, and this is just uh, talk about our first detection of cosmological signal um, in cross correlation um, with Chime. So, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Chime, this is uh, you know it's a video of the telescope. It's a transit radio interferometer located in the interior of British Columbia uh, in the Okanagan Valley. Um, you can see it's four cylindrical half pipes. Um, so along each of these are 256 dual polarized antennas and um, uh, the cylinders are lined in the north-south direction, uh, which means that you know, think it only focuses in the east-west direction. So Chime kind of instantaneously images a strip about two degrees wide and goes pretty much from the north horizon to the south horizon. Um, it uh, basically observes between 400 and 800 megahertz. And you know, the goal of Chime is to do 21 centimeter intensity mapping. So we're looking at the 21 centimeter line and, and that 400 to 800 megahertz corresponds to redshift of about 0.8 to two and a half. Um, now, Chime is a, an intensity mapping experiment. So you know, compared to a lot of uh, radio telescopes, we have reasonably poor angular resolution, um, about quarter of a degree. Um, but we see a very large fraction of the sky. We see like, you know, the entire northern sky every single day. So we, we, we basically have, you know, measurements of a, a huge fraction of the sky. Um, we've been operating Chime since about the end of 2018. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about data from, uh, you know, towards the beginning of that period. Um, okay, so just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of what Chime data looks like and how it observes, what I'm showing in here is a, um, a single day's worth of data turned into a, uh, you know, a fairly raw map of the sky. So what's been done in here is we've used the fact that Chime is a bunch of visibilities on a grid and just straightforward uh, for transform this to get a uh, instantaneous image. And then we're just taking like, you know, basically the north, south, you know, we have central north south column of that image. And each column in this map is just showing that at a different time of the day. So that's just the, the kind of dual axis here. You know, this is the, the local time. And then you know, this is the right ascension that's that's basically directly above at that time. And this produces something you know fairly straightforwardly that looks like the radio sky. Um, so what you're seeing in here, um, you know, beyond all the obvious galaxy and stuff, there's a there's a bunch of things um, which are worth noting. One what you're seeing here is the sun. Um, so the sun has a bunch of effects when it's directly overhead, it's, it's very bright, it starts to saturate things a little bit. 
Um, but it's also sufficiently bright that you can see it well into the side lobes of the instrument. So the sun's basically visible during the entire daytime. Um, this means one of the things we basically need to do to, to for high sensitivity analysis is just throw away all the daytime data. It's, it's far easier to throw it away than to attempt to figure out how to clean it out at the moment. Um, you can also see that you have the same horseshoes where you're seeing the source of the side lobes for all the bright radio point sources. So Sige Kase, Taue, a little bit on Virgo and stuff. Um, so, you know, we can need to do a little bit of work peeling this, peeling this out. Uh, sort of another notable feature in here is this aliasing structure. So you see the sun here, but you also see a copy of the same emission here. That's because at these um, frequencies, the uh, shortest baseline and chime is a little bit too long. And in a single instant, you can't uniquely localize the uh, emission in north-south direction. Um, you can get rid of this aliasing effect if you, if you stitch time samples together. Um, so if you use the essentially the different fringe rates um, in here to, to sort this out, but you uh, um, this is something we need to be aware of. Um, a fun thing is that because chime sees over the pole, and this is a you know this is light looks like a map but isn't really a map. Uh, this here is the antipodal observation of Cassie, and this is its a list down here. So you know when you are looking at chime data, you have to do a little bit of work trying to interpret exactly what you're seeing. Um, so. We're going to do a cross correlation analysis of the chime data, and what we're going to cross correlate against is the is optical uh, gal galaxy catalogs. Uh, we're going to use catalogs from EBOS, which is the the last iteration of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, there are three galactic traces we're interested in. There are the luminous red galaxies, which are just bright uh, old red galaxies. Um, they are mostly limited to low redshifts because they're observed with absorption lines and they just, they sort of, uh, you know, they, they redshift out of the, yeah, red, blue shift out of the spectrograph, I guess. Um, the ELG's emission line galaxies, um, there's a visible high redshifts. They have a sort of like UV uh, emission lines that are, are visible over a higher, higher range, um, uh, at a higher redshift, sorry. And um, the final thing we're going to use a, a Quasars. So this panel here is just showing the, the redshift distributions of all of these. You can see the quasars extend to very high redshift. Um, uh, the problem with the quasars is that they're low density. So that's a problem if you're trying to do a, a sort of analysis of the quasars for themselves. But for us, actually, that's that, that's fine. Um, now, um, in this analysis, we're taking uh, data primarily from uh, 2019, so the sort of first year chimes operating. Um, we're focusing on the upper end of our, our band, just the foregrounds that are a little bit dimmer, the signal's probably a little bit brighter, there's a little less RFI in here. I have to deal with this, it's just easy to focus on this end. Um, after we've, you know, uh, basically gone through automated and manual vetoes of the data we've taken, we end up with about 100 100 nights that we're, we're processing here. Um, of that, we need to flag out nearly 50% of the band due to uh, persistent RFI, like LTE bands, which are very annoying, and um, other transient sources of RFI. Um, you know, once we have that, we need to regrid all these individual um, data's, uh, data's data onto a common grid and set real time, and then we average everything together. Um, and we also peel out the bright point sources, like I mentioned earlier. And that, that takes you from something like a large ensemble of days to just a single single days with the data, effective days with the data. Um, although I should note, this is all of this is done in visibility space, uh, not actually in map space like this illustration. Um, we need to do some further processing uh, to the data to, to get it down to the level that we can do an effective cross correlation. Um, so what I'm showing in the right side of this is just a, uh, a illustration of the map that you would get if you um, at each stage of, of this analysis. And you notice that the color bar actually goes down significantly through these through the stages. So the first thing we do is we throw away all the intracell and the baselines. So um, they tend to be contaminated by crosstalk, where noise is broadcast from one antenna to the other. 
Um, they also have a lot of diffuse uh, galactic emission uh, is within those baselines. And so it's, it's easier to throw them out at the moment. Um, we would hope to be able to bring those back into subsequent analyses, but for the moment, we're just gonna throw them out. Um, that basically takes off a factor of 10 or 20 in the um, in emission from the sky doing this. Um, we then apply a delay filter um, just to remove the smooth modes in the frequency direction. So, uh, um, and this is, um, you know, reduces the amount of foreground uh, emission that we see significantly. You can see in this middle panel that there are some residuals which basically follow these tracks of point sources to the side load. So this is where the peeling out of the point sources has not been perfect and we're just getting residuals in here. Um, to get rid of those, we do a fairly straightforward uh, outlier mask, just flagging out six sigma outliers, which we, we don't think um, after a whole bunch of simulations affects the signal in any way, but that basically gets rid of these uh, you know, these structures in here. Um, now, having done that, we can actually generate a uh, realization of Gaussian noise with the same uh, estimated variance as our data, and you get something like this. Um, so, uh, you know, compared to the um, compared to the actual data, you can see that they they're very similar in, in kind of apparent structure. Um, the residuals we find in actual data are about 20% larger than we'd expect just from thermal noise. Um, so we're not quite thermal noise dominated, but we're, we're pretty close uh, with what we get out of this. Now, the way that um, we're going to go about this cross correlation is a, is a stacking uh, analysis. So we're going to take, in, this part is the analysis is actually done in map space. So we take the pixel that we expect a one of these catalog sources to be in, and we extract the spectrum uh, for that pixel. And we do this for you know tens of thousands of sources. And we once we've got them, we basically shift them in the frequency direction to align um, everything on the redshift you know, of the source. So you can see a, an illustration of what goes on here. The, you know, the effective source is at this red position, and we shift everything to coherently align, and then we add everything up. Now, if you do that to this process data and with these EBOS catalogs, you end up with, with this, this result. So this is showing the stacked signal um, of the chime data on all these EBOS traces. You can show, see that we get a high significance detection of all three catalogs um, across a broad range of redshifts in here, um, uh, which is great. We're you know, very happy with this. Um, this is the highest redshift uh, 21 centimeter intensity mapping detections and I think the first with an interferometer. Um, uh, so uh, this has been very good. Um, so the next step having got this signal is, is trying to interpret it. So we can we see we have something in here, but what are we actually seeing? So um, the first thing to kind of understand is what um, scales we're we measuring. So you know, phrase this as what Fourier, you know, cosmological Fourier modes are we actually measuring in here. So this plot is just showing for um, three kind of central uh, frequencies or three central redshifts, like what range, what region of uh, K space are we actually sensitive to? Now, you can see there's two obvious cuts in here, like this, we're missing the, um, uh, large angular scales because we threw away these interest on the baselines. Um, down at the bottom, we are missing um, small, uh, very large wavelength um, radial modes because we uh, we apply this delay filter and we use quite a harsh cut. And unfortunately, when you combine these two, what you're missing is these linear scales down here. So the you know, linear scales are the ones which would be easy to analyze cosmologically. Um, and we've thrown away the bulk of them in this. So although we've seen something, it's gonna be a little bit tougher to analyze. Um, so to get around this, we need to, to, to work at the modeling somewhat. Um, we go through a, um, a sort of model where we try to capture the various um, phenomenological things we expect to be in the data. Uh, with you know uh, sort of seven parameters modeling this. Um, we have 
a couple of parameters which model the very large scale um, behavior of the uh, of the H1. Um, in here is the you know the fraction of mass in the universe that's in the H1 and the um, the bias of the H1 relative to dark matter. Um, we have a parameter capturing the uh, the bias of the galactic uh, sample, although this one is actually very well constrained from from other um, you know from actually analyzing the galaxy data. Um, something that is actually of interest, although we mostly treat it as a nuisance parameter, is the H1 content of the actual galaxy itself. Now, this gives us a correlated short noise contribution in our, in our measurements. Um, and, uh, you know, the last few things are, you know, we need to model the fingers of God, which come from a small scale velocity dispersion. And we need to model the nonlinear power spectrum shape. Um, uh, really now, funny. what you're seeing in here, is the um, uh, just the effect on the power spectrum, and here we've seen the effect on the stack signal. So we can probably see in here is actually all of these tweaking these parameters. A lot of them actually are fairly degenerate, which is going to be problematic for um, for trying to disentangle them. There's only a couple of modes which are, are, are sort of really kind of distinct in here. Okay, so what comes out of this? So if we feed this through uh, a uh, basically a Bayesian analysis of fitting this model to the data. Um, we, uh, you know, get a whole bunch of quite classic constraint faults. You can see there's a whole bunch of degeneracies in here, which I don't want to go into massively because uh, it's not the time, unfortunately. What I want you to focus on is, is really this panel here. This is showing constraints on what is essentially an amplitude parameter, an amplitude for the, the large scale 21 centimeter signal. And there's two sets of constraints in here. The blue is what you get if you fix the parameters which model the nonlinear scales. The red is what happens if you vary these, you allow yourself to marginalize over them. And you can see that the, the way you allow these nonlinear parameters to vary and you try and include uncertainty in them in your analysis, your constraints are significantly weaker. Um, so, um, although when you do this, the signal to noise in the detection is essentially unchanged. So the thing to think about here is, you know, um, although this red, uh, like posterior distribution is a lot wider, actually the probability of getting down to zero in both cases is about the same. Um, so the, this red distribution is very non-Gaussian. Now you can go through and essentially take these constraints where we have included the uncertainties from nonlinear modeling, and uh, you can uh, basically turn them into constraints on the total fraction of neutral hydrogen in the universe. So here you're seeing our, our um, data, um, you know, just showing the, distribute, the difference between the quasar measurements, the uh, LRGs and the ELGs, and this is compared to, to other measurements uh, and the redshift you have blind H1 surveys and then uh, stacking H1 surveys and then that line alpha systems up here. Um, okay, I am going to uh, skip this slide um, and just come back to it in the in the summary. So um, uh, just to summarize, uh, it seems like we have the first cosm detection of cosmological signal with Chime um, uh, via cross correlating EBOS. Um, the key limitation in this analysis at the moment is modeling of these nonlinear scales. Um, there's two ways to get around this. One is to improve the foreground filtering to allow us to go to larger scales. And the other one is actually to improve the modeling of the nonlinear scales themselves. Now, the one thing that's great about having a cross correlation detection is that the goal of CHIME is not to cross correlate with things, but it's actually to be able to see barren acoustic oscillations in the 21 say middle auto correlation. Um, and having a cross correlation is a fantastic tool to be able to allow you to optimize the analysis. You need to know when you're foreground filtering how much signal you're throwing away in order to know how well your foreground filter is doing. And, and we have a tool that allows us to do that now. Anyway, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Great talk. Uh, we have time for one quick question. Uh, yeah, Mario, you can unmute yourself. Thanks. Uh, so uh, 
at the moment, uh, do you know what's the the main um, systematic that's uh, you know preventing you from uh, from getting to the autocorrelations, or is it just a, a combination of many? <laughs> it's a, I think a combination of of many. Um, we. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a combination of many. Certain things just turn out, out to be tricky. Like we have a lot of RFI excised, which means that actually getting, um, you know, you're seeing, we see RFI at low levels in the data. And I think that forms a large part of our residuals. Um, the, you know, stuff that we just haven't managed to excise because it's below the threshold. Um, the, the beam models end up being, you know, quite problematic. So in Chime, you're seeing, uh, you know, you're seeing point sources like a long way out in the side lobes of your beam. And it's just very hard to measure what's going on there. So if you want to accurately peel stuff out, uh, that's, you know, that's tough. And so that that's what causes you to see all of these systematics in here. So it's easy to mask to remove for the bright point sources, but for dimmer things, it's, it's harder. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it's going to be improving beam models, improving RFI excision, you know, the, the works basically. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Richard. Uh, next is uh, Yuan Shi, uh, who will talk about 21 centimeter global spectrum measurement on the lunar orbit. OK, thank you. I will show my screen. OK, thanks, everyone. And Yuan, and uh, I feel very excited to have the opportunity to give this speech. I'm a third year PhD uh, student at National Astronomical Observatories in Beijing. As you can see from the title, I will be talking about the 21 centimeter global spectrum measurement on the lunar orbit. It is based on a future survey called the Discovering the Sky at the Longest Wavelength. Mm, we call it a DSL mission, also known as a Homo mission, which means the primordial universe in Chinese. My talk is organized as follows. First, uh, I will talk about some introductions and the background. Uh, here I show a timeline of our, of our universe from the Big Bang to today. Following the recombination, we've got the dark age. There's nothing but uh, neutral hydrogen. As the time as the time goes on, the first lunar uh, luminous objects, which known as the cosmic dawn, and then these objects continue to evolve eventually. Before ionization began to take place in universe, and then later in time. Uh, structures began to form and then in recent history, it remains a gap in knowledge about the cosmic history. However, because of the neutral hydrogen, the 21 centimeter signal would be a unique tracer to help us unlock the secret of the early universe. The 21 centimeter global spectrum is ex experiments aim to measure the sky average the, uh, spectrum with high precision so as to probe the early epochs of the universe. There is a number of such ground-based experiments include uh, Edge, and they have reported the first detection of an uh, absorption signal corresponding to the cos cosmic dawn, which is unexpectedly large as compared with the predictions from the standard model. That invoke a variety of mechanisms to explain the large absorption signal, such as the extra cooling of the cosmic gas and the so on. Then many other experiments with a variety of designs are also trying to measure the global 21 centimeter signal. Uh, however, the ground-based uh, observation of the sky at uh, low frequencies is hindered by the ionosphere of the Earth and the radio frequency interference. So we have proposed the DSL machine in space. Uh, in the DSL or home mission concept, 
uh, an array of satellites will be launched together on the lunar orbit. One of the satellites will be a bigger one and shall be called the mother satellite, which serves to collect the data from the other mother, uh, from uh, which serves to collect the data from the other smaller daughter satellites and uh, transmit the data back to the Earth with a high gain antenna, whereas the daughter satellites make the actual observations during the mission at the far side of the lunar orbit, most of the satellites will make interferometric in map making and map the foreground at the low frequencies. Mm, and then one of the satellites will make high precision global spectrum measurements to detect the monopole signal. Uh, at the cosmic bound, the data will be transmitted to the Earth at the near side part. Uh, at the near side part of the orbit, however, there also exists uh, several problems, such as the orbit parameters, uh, the moon shade effect, and the uh, antenna design and the system noise. Uh, then we then I will talk about these problems one by one. First, uh, I will introduce end-to-end um, -end simulation and some models we used in this work. First is about the foreground model. Here we have developed a foreground model called the Orsa model, uh, which has incorporated the free free absorption effect at low frequencies. And the code for Orsa model and the relevant relevant sky maps are, uh, are available in public. Here we show some sky maps generated by uh, this model. And uh, the red figure shows the difference between the foreground global spectrum from absorption uh, and the absorption free uh, effect, uh, uh, from absorption and the free, absorption free maps. Here we also introduce two sky models. For, first is about the linear logarithm model, and another is about the polar, polar, uh, polynomial model. In the following, we examine the fit by using the root mean square of these residues. Then we generate several models to see which model provides a better basis for sub subtracting uh, foreground here we uh, generated the, here we generated the sky maps and use this model to uh, fit them we can see the five times uh, linear logarithm model um, can fit well in all cases and we take it as our fiducial model to fit the foreground we find um then we will consider the 21 centimeter signal models. First is the 21 centimeter model by edge experiment. The second is a simple Gaussian model. The red figure shows the 21 centimeter signal for different cases. The gray dashed line describes the case uh, that there is no 21 centimeter global signal to be detected. And uh, the blue line shows the uh, 21 centimeter um, of edge detection. And the yellow and green line shows the, uh, describes the evolution of 21 centimeter um, from the Gaussian model uh, with, different, uh, with different parameters. Uh, based on the uh, after show the foreground model and 21 centimeter model, we will um, talk about the orbit parameter setup. Uh, we, sh we shall consider a nearly circular orbit for the array of satellites. In choosing the orbit parameters, we keep in mind three aspects of the uh, problem first is about the stability of the orbit, and the second is about the good observation time during which the Earth or the Sun is shielded, and the, the second 
uh, and uh, and the third is about the nodal the nodal precision of the orbit, which generates a three-dimensional distribution of baselines, which is important in map making. Uh, here we uh, in in this table we show the fraction of good observation time for. Mm, different inclination angles during five years. In this ob observation, we will choose a uh, mm, uh, two. Uh, we will choose a three thousand kilometer circular orbit with an inclination of thirty degrees. Uh, in this table, we we was we was uh, uh, list the basic parameters of the DSL concept that are relevant to our simulation. Mm, in this work, we consider two antenna cases. In first case, we consider a disc cone antenna with a, di a diameter of 55 centimeter disc, which has a nearly frequency independent beam profile. We show the beam, mm, we show the beam gain profile and the frequency gradient of the beam gain. Next, as an example of a frequency dependent beam, we consider a disc cone antenna with a diameter of 3000 centimeter disc. There is a, a significant variation of the beam profile with, fre with frequency and a, a uh, and a small satellite will appear at the 120 megahertz. Mm, then we will also uh, plot uh, the residues for these uh, two antenna cases. Um, we can see that the residue for the large uh, for the large antenna case is significantly higher than that of the small antenna case. And for the small antenna, we can uh, the frequency dependent beam effect could be filtered uh, could be filtered out with our foreground model. And uh, in uh, in case of the large antenna beam, uh, there is a significant residue and uh, cannot be removed. So we should uh, uh, so that should be carefully handled. Uh, then, um, then we can get some simulated signal from this equation and uh, the noise we can, and we can obtain the noise uh, for the, um, for the um, 30 to 120 megahertz band, we have, a sing we have one single antenna and after turn out, after one, uh, one one day observation, uh, we can require uh, an IMS uh, noise level less than less than fifteen at uh, uh, at seventy five megahertz, and uh, for the one to for the ten to thirteen megahertz band, we will have eight to uh, we will have five to eight satellites. And each is equipped with three antennas. It will take more than 10,000 hours of integration time to reach the required noise level. So the DSL machine has the potential to measure the 21 centimeter global spectrum from the dark age and the cosmic dawn. In this talk, we focus on the former one and make simulations to detect the 21 centimeter at cosmic dawn. First, we observe the foreground spectral at four positions on the lunar orbit. In the top panels, we show the beam seen from four different uh, positions at one orbit. The shape of beam depends on the position of the satellite on the orbit. We set the beam value of the pixels within the range from zero to one to determine the visible pro probability. The bottom figure shows the signal received at 60 megahertz over one day observation. The black dashed line is the spectral 
uh, for one day continuous observation and the red solid line accounts for the effective observation time during which the satellite is shielded by the moon from the Earth. Here we will attempt to make a simple analysis model. We make a linear weighted least square fit of the signal and the foreground model with the mock observation data. We fit the foreground, use the five terms linear log logarithm log model and fit the 21 centimeter signal by the edges model and the simple Gaussian model. Then we consider a foreground only model we generate read the other sky maps at uh, uh, 30 to 120 megahertz with free free absorption effect. The mock observation signal includes the noise moon shade effect and the antenna beam. The left figure shows the difference between the antenna temp um, temperature uh, the left figure shows the difference between the antenna temperature and the recover, recover the sky temperature after fitting and removing the foreground. The noise correspond to the noise level corresponds to turn obvious ob observation. And in right figure, we plot best fit parameters yeah, of the foreground. In this work, we focus on whether the 21 centimeter can be detected by the satellite orbit, orbit, orbiting the moon in addition to the observational limitations like noise, moon shade, and uh, antenna beam. The left figure shows the input foreground model and the 21 centimeter models. And uh, in the right figure, we also plot the observed signal after 10 orbits observation fitting results for three 21 centimeter models after effective 10 orbits observation. The blue solid line show, uh, shows the residues after fitting and removing only the foreground, where the orange line denotes the residues after fitting and removing the combined foreground and the 21 centimeter signal. And the green line, the green line shows the recovered 21 cent centimeter signals with the noise. Here we also plot the MS values vary with time as the satellite move around the orbit. Then here is my conclusion. The current work provides the first simulation of upcoming lunar orbit survey by end-to-end uh, -end simulation. We show that high sensitivity can be obtained despite, uh, despite some practical issues may, may affect the observation such as the moon shade antenna beam, noise, and so on. However, it is only the first step in this direction as many, sim um, and as many simplifications were made and a lot of practical issues were ignored. These problems will be further investigated in future studies. There was, uh, here are all the papers about this mission. So that's all from me. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, interesting talk. Anyone has any questions? Mm, okay, I have a quick question. Uh, have you studied the effect of coupling, mutual coupling from the other satellites or the same satellites and the self reflections and RFI? Mm, uh, which, uh, uh, can you repeat your question? Uh, uh, have you considered the effect of the RFI from the satellite itself and any reflections from the satellite on which the antenna will be located? We uh, uh, we haven't uh, considered yet, uh, but I will um, uh, think about it and, and I will try to get back to you uh, with uh, answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions? 
Okay, so let's move the discussion to the Slack. Uh, next up is uh, by Nicole Barry, who will talk about the consequences of misrepresenting the beam in 21 centimeter power spectrum and RM synthesis analysis. Go ahead. Great, thanks, Brett. All righty, yeah. So, like the title says, I'm going to talk about two separate topics today. Um, but they are connected, and that's uh, the 21 centimeter power spectra and rotation measure synthesis. So these two topics are connected because they both rely on um, the sensitivity of your instrument, and they rely on Fourier transforms. And so a lot of the uh, there's, there's a lot of similarity when it comes to the effects of uh, uh, poor beam modeling on, on both of these. So starting off with rotation measure synthesis, um, you essentially are looking for the Faraday dispersion, which is the intrinsic polarization along the line of sight. This is the thing that you would like to measure. Um, but what you've actually measured is the linear polarization and that's uh, modified by the sensitivity of the instrument itself. Um, they're related via a Fourier transform of the uh, wavelength squared. Um, and uh, that complicates things because let's say you have two polarizations um, and, and two, two separate uh, uh, measuring elements uh, to make up a baseline. Um, and these have uh, gains for each of these separate polarized uh, elements. Um, one measuring X, one measuring Y, let's say, uh, you can propagate uh, the effects of those gains all the way through um, Stokes parameters and it's uh, really gross, but you can do it. And uh, something that we've seen is uh, by modifying those gain parameters, the actual uh, uh, Faraday depth that you've measured can change. So this is the simulation where everything in the instrument is going great. You saw a source um, that uh, has a Faraday depth of uh, 20 um, for a certain amount of polarized flux density. This is perfect. This is what you would want to see um, coming out of your instrument. But let's say the X polarization in that baseline actually only had 90% of the gain then you get leakage into the uh, DC mode of the Faraday depth. And the bad thing about this is that it's actually reduced to the flux density that you measure. And so you'll make an incorrect measurement if your instrument isn't perfectly healthy. And worse still, if you have some sort of phase error between these two uh, polarizations, um, let's say uh, uh, one of the cables was slightly longer and you had a 90 uh, degree offset in the phase, then you start to get a reversal of the Faraday depth. Now it's at minus 20 um, and you can actually get a complete reversal if you're uh, off by 180 degrees. Um, and so this is really uh, pointing at the fact that um, the health of the instrument is critically important and at least for the MWA, having dipoles have less gain is uh, a very common problem as uh, these, as long as this instrument ages. So it's something that we're looking at. And in particular, uh, Amon Chokshi is uh, uh, simulating these effects. Um, I'm uh, talking about this subject on his behalf because he's currently uh, uh, gavelanting around the South Pole this is a picture of the uh, uh, eclipse that happened a couple of days ago. Um, but stay tuned for his work coming out in 2022 on this subject. And moving on into how this affects power spectra, we have to take a second to look at what we actually measured, and that's visibilities. Visibilities, uh, they are modified by the beam response and the sky intensity of uh, what you're looking at and the geometric phase term uh, or the sampled mode uh, that depends on the baseline separation between your elements. And uh, the Van Zernicke theorem says that uh, essentially you can um, Fourier transform 
um, this to reconstruct your image. But the issue is that you're measuring millions of visibilities every few minutes, um, and you want to combine them together uh, efficiently. And so in general, um, the community uses uh, a technique called gridding. And that's, that's uh, honestly, there's a whole lot of words here. It really is just a histogram in UV space. And so in order to histogram in UV space, you have to understand that A term or your beam sensitivity. This is what that sensitivity looks like if you were lying down on your back and looking up at the night sky, this is what the instrument would see. There's a horizon, that's why there's a hard edge here. And then you see all of these uh, side lobes of the beam sensitivity uh, ringing outward towards the horizon. And what you need is the response of the beam in UV space in order to histogram in UV space. And so you would take an FFT of this and you get all this uh, uh, ripple structure. And you take each of these stamps, you multiply it by uh, the visibility that you are uh, uh, wanting to grid down into this histogram at the location of the baseline separation. And you'll get something that uh, looks like this. And here is where it gets tricky because uh, we would like to be able to do statistical analyses in power spectrum space um, that, uh, that come off of this gridding. And so what we want to do is to uh, uh, measure the maximum likelihood. That's the most likely value for a parameter. And that takes into account the data that you measured and the variances of those data. And so here on the right, I have uh, gridded down the variances of the data, which is on the left. These are uh, very similar uh, UV planes, but they are different if you look at the two. And the variances is just the beam times the beam at the location of that baseline. And so not only at the end, we be able to calculate a maximum likelihood, you'll also be able to propagate your errors all the way through your analysis and thus have an understanding of um, your, your final error bars as well. And this is a very particular choice of analysis. There are, in general, two different choices of analysis. There's optical map making, which is these uh, propagated variances, uh, um, these, this maximum likelihoods. Uh, you make apparent UV planes uh, using the real beam, the real beam sensitivity. And uh, MWA paper and HERA use things like optical map making. You can also choose to go into image space to do certain corrections to make things easier for you. And so some of those things might be anti-aliasing filters. Um, uh, however, if you do that, you can't propagate your errors quite as easily. And so you generally bootstrap those errors off of say Stokes V. And this is the particular technique of LOFAR. And uh, you can't propagate errors easily in image space. Uh, and I'm just gonna show two small equations here. Um, it really all boils down to the convolution theorem. So uh, a convolution in one space um, is a multiplication in the other Fourier space. But if you square one of these quantities, that is no longer the case. It's not quite as simple. And so if you were to apply an anti-aliasing filter to your variances, you would no longer uh, have variances in the other space. It would be some sort of a convolutional effect as well. So keeping that in mind, I would like to do optimal map making. My choices are very limited. I can't do things in the image space. Um, and that has serious consequences. So uh, I was really concerned um, about this hard horizon edge, and I wanted to investigate um, uh, the effects on the power spectrum. And one way I wanted to do that, um, or, or one way I wanted to make sure that everything's good and simulation and all that is to have a, an analytic um, input. I can't do that if I take just this FFT of this, of this thing that I have. So instead I decomposed it, this thing that I have into a series of Gaussians, because then the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. I can calculate that analytically. And so here 
is my decomposition, my Gaussian decomposition of that beam. It's made up of 18 Gaussians. And taking the analytic Fourier transform of that, I get um, a similar beam response um, compared to what I showed before. Obviously, there are some differences. It does die off after a, a certain point. And I will note this is the MWA beam in particular. Um, I've chosen this because it's a, a wide field beam uh, with very complicated side lobes. Not necessarily complicated, but uh, not <laughs> simple either. So I can simulate visibilities using this analytic beam uh, pretty easily. And so that's what I've done at the top row here. Um, so those visibilities encode this Gaussian decomposition. Um, I calculated them analytically at each baseline location. It took a week with 10 cores, not necessarily something that's practical to do when analyzing data. But I can take those simulated visibilities and plug them into our full pipeline shown here at the bottom um, as a series of icons and uh, change how I do the gridding step in particular. I'm going to choose three different ways uh, to do that gridding step and then see what the consequences are. So for experiment one, I didn't change anything about uh, the beam other than I'm no longer doing it fully analytic. I'm doing it with a uh, gigantic lookup table, and that's generally how we approach histogramming um, or how we approach gridding um, for power spectra analyses in order to get uh, the appropriate resolution, but still do it within the Hubble time. For experiment two, I'm going to uh, uh, change the beam response such that the side lobes are only uh, half in power. Um, so this is connecting to that rotation measure uh, experiment I showed at the beginning. What happens if um, your instrumental response is actually different uh, than what you expected? In experiment three, say, you know what, I don't care. Um, let's just get the, the main component, um, no side lobes anymore. Uh, this is kind of going along the lines of those uh, anti-aliasing filters. Uh, but applying it within the gridding space rather than the image space. And so again, just to recap, experiment one, everything's perfect. Experiment two, I measured my beam poorly. Experiment three, I didn't care about my beam. Uh, these have different footprints in Fourier space. Obviously, they're, they're, uh, they're, they were different in image space. Um, one thing to note here is that the single Gaussian will have a much smaller footprint in Fourier space. Um, that's actually a, a fantastic result because then that means you don't have to include as many pixels in your uh, lookup table. It means you don't have to include as many pixels when you're actually gridding. Um, for each, each stamp. Uh, so that's a, a significant speed up, especially when you're considering the fact that you're gridding 4 million visibilities every two minutes. Um, each of these colored lines indicates a different uh, level at which to cut the beam. Uh, it's important to kind of make a choice as to where you're going to stop uh, gridding um, because I guess you could grid forever. You could have an infinite stamp size uh, but you would never actually analyze your visibilities. And so we're trying to find this Goldilocks zone of including as many pixels as possible, but um, still finishing our observations. So this is what that looks like in power spectrum space, choosing this these variety of stamp sizes. Um, so uh, the one thing to note here is that if it's in the gray shaded region, then it can theoretically measure the epoch of reionization. That's the goal. So the Goldilocks zone really is 0.001% um, of the maximum. So I need to go out to at least 0.001% uh, of the maximum beam size in order to measure the epic of reionization. Um, that being said, maybe um, even one step down would be better. Uh, one thing to note here is that um, I have broken a rule of optimal map making. And in this process for at least like the single Gaussian case, uh, because I'm no longer using the real beam, the, my errors are no longer optimal. They're no longer the lowest they could possibly be. 
But given how many more pixels I had to include when I had side lobes, perhaps it's better to um, uh, have slightly worse, slightly larger error bars um, uh, in order to speed things up. Um, what I also want to see um, the effect of is uh, calibration, specifically the most basic form of calibration, direction independent calibration. One thing I need um, in order to do that is to degrid. Degridding is the reverse operation. Um, essentially, I have a UV plane uh, with uh, the uh, uh, tons of point sources contributing to this UV plane. And then at each location of the baseline, I integrate up um, uh, the, the beam kernel multiplied by um, the response at that point. And when I do that with a perfect beam, I get horrible, horrible errors. So um, this dashed line is the epic of rainization, and this purple line is that perfect beam. And I included all of the sources in calibration as I did in simulation. This should have been a perfect calibration. Um, however, the input was um, analytic in that each of the 18 Gaussians were placed perfectly. Two minutes uh, left. Thanks, yeah. Um, whereas the experiment uh, uh, was discrete in that I had a lookup table. What this means is that the resolution requirement for gridding and degridding are actually different. Um, so the lookup table was totally fine when I was doing just gridding, as you saw previously. Degridding, it isn't. And further on from that, misrepresentations of this beam shape, say uh, with the single Gaussian, uh, can cause up to 500% more errors in this space, which I'm not going to show um, in the essence of time. One last thing I want to show just as a teaser, um, if I draw your attention to this uh, beam response here, if I add a horizon, that's still analytic. Um, I've added a spherical top hat. I have to do a convolution, which takes forever if you're doing a true convolution, but I can do it. And so that's what the response looks like in UV space. It is infinite because I have an infinitely harsh edge. And again, I cannot use an anti-aliasing filter for optimal map making. So I have to find another way to get around this. Um, unfortunately, um, this means that the, the, the contamination in power spectrum space um, is quite high, um, roughly at the level of the epic of reionization. Uh, if I'm just doing straight gridding, I can use that single Gaussian like I showed before, no problem. But if I want to do calibration um, from a true sense, from a true optimal map making sense, I cannot get around this. And so we're looking into mitigation techniques for that. Just to summarize, um, you can use a non-instrumental gridding kernel and still propagate errors. Essentially, you can break one of the rules of optimal map making, but still propagate errors, as long as there's no image space corrections. Um, and that you must re reproduce the instrument for calibration or your errors will be even higher. Degridding and gridding requirements are different. Um, and this would all be so much easier if there just wasn't any uh, horizon. <laughs> so uh, if, if wide field instruments could taper down before the horizon, that would be great. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Nicole. Great talk. Uh, we have a question from Etienne. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, sorry, one second. All right, sorry about that. Very cool talk, Nicole. Uh, thank you for, for sharing. I just want to say regarding the um, uh, what you said regarding the fact that the variance cannot be graded straightforwardly through the Fourier transform. That's right. Uh, but in fact, there is a Fourier transform relationship between the variance of the visibilities and the variance of the image plane. And therefore, there's an inverse Fourier transform. And we can talk about this offline if you're interested. But it has been formalized. And it's, uh, it's a cool little relationship. But uh, yeah. Cool. I would love to know more about that. I know there is some tenuous connections one could make, uh, but they're very complicated. So I would like to know more about. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about a formal proof that, yeah. Uh, but we can talk about this offline. Okay. Uh, Harish? 
Yeah, Nicole, uh, I, I think I maybe misunderstood something you said. So in, in terms of the calibration, if we, let's say, predict the visibilities for calibration or the no upcoming nonlinear optimization using full well knowledge of, of your beam, right, and making an apparent source and actually predicting the exact value of the measured visibility from the exact location of the source. And the, isn't that calculation optimal or what is not optimal in that? Um, are you talking about like optimal map making and calibration? No, I'm, I, I thought you were talking generally, generally of calibration, right? So yeah, we so... 10 sources and we know the beam gains, polarized beam gains in those 10 directions. Then... Right, right. Um, so I think maybe I, I might be misinterpreting your question, but I think maybe what you're coming at is like, why don't you just do the apparent flux um, rather than trying to correct for it um, in, in, in a degridding step that that beam response. And uh, um, I don't know if that's quite your uh, question, but if it is, um, that works really well if you have just point sources. Um, if you would like to have a full sky, of uh, diffuse emission, you are going to um, have uh, uh, basically an interaction with, with the horizon um, uh, on the edge, and you won't. It, it'll be much more difficult to calculate the apparent uh, brightness of the of a full sky rather than just point sources. Oh, okay, I, I think now I understand what you're getting at. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, let's continue the discussion in Slack. Um, next up is Ankita Vera. Uh, she's going to talk about impact of cosmic ray heating on global 21 centimeter signal. Yeah. Hello, Masu, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Ankita Vera. I'm a PhD student at Presidency University, Kolkata. So today I'll discuss about a source of heating uh, that is important during cosmic dawn and its impact on the intergalactic medium or on the global 21 centimeter signal. And this work I have done in collaboration with Somadip Shamui and Kanan Datta. Just a minute. No, it's working. Oh, okay, so to start with, I'll briefly mention the processes which are responsible for this cosmic history. And these uh, first absorption profile arises due to the thermal decoupling of the cosmic gas from the CMBR. And this period is known as dark ages, as at that time there were no sources of light. Now, with the formation of first stars or the first generation of galaxies, the lamin alpha photons generated from these comes into the picture. And it alters the spin states of the hydrogen um, hyperfine levels. So this part of the absorption profile is mostly governed by the Lyman alpha photons. Now, as soon as any heating sources arises that heats the surrounding gas and this absorption profile starts to rise. Now in the literature, it is generally considered that the X-ray emission from the first generation of galaxies heats the intergalactic media which leads to these heating profile. And finally, it goes to the emission region. Now, here comes our work that we are considering a non-standard heating mechanism that is heating by cosmic ray particles. Now, it is non-standard in the sense that it is not extensively used in the literature, but it's not in the exotic physics. It's just another source of heating during this period. Now, there are a few works on the cosmic rays, but uh, the detailed analysis that how it affects the thermal and the ionization history during cosmic dawn is not well discovered yet. So we try to explore that. And there are a few works in the post UR scenario as well. And this reference is one of them. So in short, we will consider the Lyman alpha photons and the cosmic ray protons from the first stars in our model instead of X-rays. So now let's see how much efficient these cosmic ray particles are in heating the intergalactic medium. Now to determine these, the first question that arises is the origin of the cosmic rays. Now generally the cosmic ray protons are generated and accelerated from the shocks that are created during supernova explosions. Now there are another processes such as the termination shocks which are generated uh, by galaxies through outflows 
and the acceleration shocks that are created during structure formation. And the next question is how much energy are getting injected into the cosmic ray protons? And to answer that, we need to know the star formation rate density. And for that, we have uh, done the semi-analytical modeling of metal-free population three stars in mini halos and the metal-enriched population two stars as well at high redshift. Now, there are several works which suggested that uh, the low energy proton generated from the supernova associated with the pop three stars can escape from their host mini halos into the surrounding medium. But in case of pop two stars, only the high energy particles can escape and participate. And a fraction epsilon of these uh, of the supernova kinetic energy, this ESN, gets utilized to accelerate the cosmic rays. Here, FSN is the number of supernova explosions. Now, in order to calculate the SFRDs for both POP3 and POP2 stars, we consider the Shetorman mass function. So now we are only left with a min, that is the minimum mass that can form stars, and this m star dot, which is the star formation rate, and these are different for POP3 and POP2 stars. Now, POP3 stars form in small halos where the gas cools via molecular hydrogen cooling, and the halo's temperature should be less than 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. Now, Tecmac 1997 found that the molecular hydrogen varies with the halo's virial temperature like this. And the cooling to be efficient to form stars, this criteria FH2 uh, should be greater than F critical H2. And this provides the minimum mass. But as soon as the uh, first generation of stars form, they produce a background of Lyman Warner photons. Now, these photons have energy between 11.5 to 13.6 electron volt that can photo dissociate the molecular hydrogen. So, to calculate, uh, we calculate the Lyman Warner flux, which is related to this Lyman Warner co moving luminosity density. And these can uh, again be calculated from the SFRT. So these relations are basically interconnected. So we solve this simultaneously. And we will see later that how the minimum mass changes due to the presence of the Lyman Warner background. Now, for M star dot, as there are no consensus regarding the POP3 IMF, we are considering a scenario where a POP3 star of 145 solar mass is forming per galaxy, which is likely to explode as a supernova. But in principle, it can be varied. Now, once the halos reach the virial temperature of 10 to the power 4 Kelvin, the POP2 stars started to form through atomic cooling. Now, we take the uh, supernova feedback regulated star formation model as it can describe the galaxy luminosity function up to redshift 10, and it can also explain the observed stellar mass in galaxies of masses 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 13 solar mass. This uh, star formation rate is related uh, to the mass outflow rate like this, and this proportionality constant is chosen in such a way that it feeds the UV luminosity function at high redshift galaxies. This FT fixes the uh, duration of the star formation in terms of dynamical time scale tau, and the F star is optimized to feed different available observation of high redshift galaxies. So with this, we plot minimum and maximum masses corresponding to pop three star and the Lyman Warner fluxes. In this uh, left hand side plot, this black dashed curve denotes the mass corresponding to molecular cooling cutoff temperature of 10 to the power 4 Kelvin. This green dotted curve is the minimum mass that comes from the Tecmark criteria. And then if we consider the Lyman Warner feedback, the minimum mass that can host POP3 stars increases after a certain redshift that we can see from this red solid curve. In this uh, right hand side plot, uh, we have plotted the Lyman Warner fluxes for both POP3 and POP2 stars. And in case of POP2, there are other strong feedbacks uh, than the Lyman Warner, so it doesn't change the POP2 SFRDs. But the contribution of Lyman Warner photons from POP2s actually changes the total Lyman Warner flux, which affects the POP3 SFRD. So we solve this self consistently. And here, this uh, red dashed one is the contribution from POP3, and the blue dotted one is from POP2. And with this, we get. I'm sorry, it's not moving. Uh, just give me a moment. 
I think I should stop share and share again. Oh, no, it's moving. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, uh, so with this, we get the POP3 and POP2 SFRD. And for POP2, we are taking the data directly from summary 2014. So to get the detailed modeling, I refer to this paper. And as we can see from here that the POP3 stars, which is this red dashed one, it dominate up to redshift 20. And then the total star formation rate is mainly uh, dominated by the pop two stars. So now we have the total SFRDs. Um, we can compute the average rate of cosmic rays, which are uh, generated in the star forming regions. So in general, the cosmic ray spectrum can be written as a power law in momentum space, where this uh, Q is the slope of the spectra, which has a typical value of 2.2. And the spectrum has a lower energy cutoff of 10 keV. Now, unlike UV photons, in case of uh, cosmic ray protons, we have the liberty to consider the particles generated at the present redshift and the particles coming from previous redshift as well. So along with the injected spectra, we also take into account the evolved spectra to calculate the total number density of the cosmic rays. Now, as these particles first propagate within the high redshift star forming galaxy and then into the intergalactic medium, their velocity gets changed. And the evolution of the velocity is governed by three processes, the collision with the free electron, the ionization of neutral hydrogen, and the adiabatic expansion of the universe. Now, during their propagation, they gradually lose their energy by ionizing and exciting the hydrogen and helium atoms, thus uh, heating the ambient gas, which we calculate through this gamma CR. Now, in case of uh, supernova exploding in mini halos, the low energy protons, which have energy less than 30 MeV, can escape the halo and hit the intergalactic medium via collision with free electron and the ionization of neutral hydrogen. Now, these supernovas are more energetic than the core collapse supernova. So, uh, the shock front reaches the virial radius within uh, state of failure phase. So it becomes easier to get uh, injected into the intergalactic medium as the cosmic rays are getting generated outside the virial radius. Whereas in case of pop two galaxies, the low energy protons get confined within the halo and only high energy protons can escape and contribute to the heating. Now in case of collision with free electron, the entire energy loss of the cosmic ray protons be becomes the thermal energy of the intergalactic medium. But while interacting with the neutral medium, the entire energy doesn't get transferred to the free electron as it may result in the uh, primary ionization or the excitation to a discrete level. So we take into account the secondary ionization by electron, the helium abundance, and the contribution of heavy uh, CR nuclei, the cosmic ray positrons, and the electrons as well through these eta 1, eta 2, and eta 3. Now, with the formation of the first generation of galaxies, we not only get the cosmic rays, but the Lyman alpha photons are also generated, which alters the spin temperature and in turn the 21 centimeter brightness temperature. Now, we consider the Lyman alpha contribution from both POP3 and POP2 stars, and to calculate the total Lyman alpha fluxes, we take into account the cascading of Lyman N photons. And this if recycle is the probability that a Lyman N photon will generate a Lyman alpha photon for different atomic levels. And the flux is related to this uh, co-moving uh, photon low emissivity, uh, except for this spectral distribution function, which is a power law. And we normalize this factor separately for both POP3 and POP2 star. And we finally get this total Lyman alpha flux that is shown in this black solid curve, where the contribution from POP3 is the black, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, is the red dashed one, and the contribution from POP2 is the blue dotted one. Now to Check our model with the observation. We consider the very well-known AGES observation. Now, there are lots of discussions regarding the shape and the size of the absorption profile because the uh, detected uh, shape is a flattened Gaussian instead of a Gaussian profile, and the amplitude is, uh, is minus 0.5 Kelvin, which is almost two times larger than the strongest prediction. 
But here we mainly focus to feed the deeper absorption, not the flattening. And to explain that X-rays absorption, we need either X-rays radio background or the colder IgM background. And in our work, we are considering colder IgM background. And for that, we employ dark matter barrier interaction. And this interaction is rather foot like interaction, but the interaction cross section varies with the relative velocity as V to the power minus four. Now there are two effects. The cooling effect come, uh, comes from the temperature difference between the two fluids. As the dark matter temperature is colder here, it helps to cool the uh, IgM temperature. And as these uh, fluids have different velocities, uh, there will be a friction between them and both the fluids will get heated up irrespective of their own temperature. So as I uh, described earlier, these gamma CR being the heating rates due to the cosmic rays contributing from both POP3 and POP2 stars, it gets added to the temperature evolution equation along with the adiabatic term and the Compton term. And these, uh, this, uh, this is the dark matter barrier interaction term. Now in the ionization fraction evolution, we could have taken the contribution of cosmic rays as well, but we checked that this contribution is less than 1% due to the low ionization cross-section of protons. So now we vary the parameters with that are related to this interaction, the POP3, POP2 star formation, supernova energy, and the cosmic ray energy deposition, and uh, mm -hmm. its impact on the temperatures on the air, yeah, on the temperatures, uh, the, uh, the gas temperature and the spin temperature. And here I'm showing this uh, plot for one set of parameters. Now, due to the presence of high dark matter variant interaction, the gas temperature, these uh, red solid curve gets decoupled from the CMB at temperature very early and the, it decreases rapidly. Now, as a consequence, the collisional coupling between the gas temperature and the spin temperature, which is this uh, blue dashed one, uh, it uh, the, the, this coupling becomes very weak and the spin temperature gets coupled to the CMB at temperature again. Now, then the Uthusen field coupling uh, comes into the play when the Lyman alpha photons gets generated, which tries to recouple the gas temperature and the spin temperature again until any heating sources arises. Now, keeping the interaction and the star formation parameters fixed, we vary the parameters related to the cosmic rays energy deposition, that is the slope of the spectra, the uh, efficiencies of the cosmic rays, which are coming from the both POP3 and the POP2 stars. And these uh, in this left-hand side panel, the gas temperature and the spin temperature are plotted with red shifts for these parameters. And from here, we can see that the onset of the heating is at redshift 17, which is the midpoint of the ages profile. And uh, this evolution of spin temperature gets reflected into the 21 centimeter uh, brightness temperature that we plot here for these uh, parameters. And interestingly, we can see that even if we change the parameters significantly, then the heating starts from almost these uh, red shifts 17 to 17.5. And also the sharp rise of the heating profile can also be fitted very well with the uh, cosmic ray heating. Now, if we switch off the dark matter barrier interaction or the colder IgM background, then uh, we still can see the impact of the heating. Now, if I go back and forth, then one can see clearly that the depth of these, uh, of these, um, of these plots it decreases due to the absence of the dark matter variant interaction, but the heating remains quite significant. Now, in case of brightness temperature, the depth is quite low here because we have kept the lemon alpha coupling to be weak to match with the AJS profile. Uh, otherwise, the, this profile will start uh, to decrease from very early redshift. So if we apply strong lemon alpha coupling, the absorption depth will match with the standard prediction. So with this, I come to the conclusions that uh, cosmic ray heating is an efficient heating mechanism, which can be considered during the cosmic dawn in addition of X-rays. And these exist irrespective of any exotic physics. Like uh, in the future observation, if we don't get the ages like deeper absorption and we get minus 200 or minus 300 millikelvin absorption, then also this cosmic ray heating can be applied. However, even if the ages profile is true and then also we can explain its sharp heating profile by cosmic rays.
And further, we can put more stringent constraint on the cosmic ray heating parameters and its source parameters, like the parameters describing POP2 and POP3 stars at high redshift from the future 21 centimeter observation. So with this, I end here. Thank you. Thanks, Ankita. Anyone has any questions? Uh, one quick question. Um, Okay, uh, if not, uh, let's take any discussion to the Slack and move on to the next speaker, who is Mike Creel. Uh, we'll talk about imaging the southern sky at 159 megahertz with spherical harmonics. So, hi everyone. Um, can you see my slides? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so hi, um, I'm Mike, and I'm going to tell you something about the 159 megahertz uh, sky map we made with the engineering development right too, um, using spherical harmonics. I'm a PhD student at Curtin University and Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, so I'll first quickly give some background um, briefly, since most already brushed over it. Um, a major priority in radio astronomy research is uncovering uh, the mysteries of the early universe. Um, although the cosmic microwave background is well understood um, and known as a uh, residual from the Big Bang, the epoch that follows, also known as the Dark Ages, is not. Um, however, we can infer um, what happens in this epoch from looking at the differential temperature between the CMB and what we call the cosmic dawn, the epoch where the first star started to form sparking the epoch of reionization, which led to the universe we see around us today. So understanding these early um, epochs will give us a wealth of information about the universe we see around us today. So it's important to know what happens in these timelines. And one way to figure out more about this is by probing the first stars through the hyperfin, uh, hyper, hyperfine electron spin flip transition line from neutral hydrogen which emits an electromagnetic um, emission with two, uh, 21 centimeter wavelength, which then due to redshifting lowers down to the frequencies we can observe with um, our low frequency telescopes. However, detecting this 21 centimeter line doesn't come without challenges, of course, um, because it's swamped with extragalactic and galactic foregrounds before it hits our telescope, which is often three to five orders of magnitude brighter, depending on the frequencies we observe at. So ideally, we would like to observe a wide range of different frequencies with a multitude of angular scales to compose some kind of foreground model, which you can then use to subtract from our measurements to withdraw the background or the 21 centimeter signal. However, solving this uh, like interferometric equation on like three dimensions on a full celestial sphere to recover um, emissions is tricky. So normally what we do is we take a flat sky approximation um, to get like a two dimensional relation between the voltage response we see and the intensities on the sky. And how all this works really nicely for compact sources, um, for diffuse emission, it's more tricky, often leading to like complex methods to recover the sky, um, such as mosaicing. Um, Alternatively, what we can do is instead of using a Fourier relationship, is use circle harmonics instead, which are like kind of the three-dimensional equivalents. Um, so where Fourier is described, the boundary, the um, signals on the boundary of a circle, circle harmonics um, describe signals on the surface of the sphere, um, which, and we can break up these harmonics in three specific types. So if the sonal harmonics, which only, um, Ferry in um, latitude, the tessal harmonics with ferry in longitude and latitude, and then the sectoral harmonics, which only ferry in uh, longitude in all direction. And um, Shaw et al. noted that when you look at Earth's rotation and you align the spherical harmonics with Earth's axes, that any displacement on Earth over local sidereal time um, gives a shift uh, import is like similar to like shifting the spherical harmonics with only a relation to M, which means we can describe any 
um, displacement on the sky in terms of like variances on time or like signal time variances instead of the direct signals themselves, um, which allows us to do wide field transit um, interferometry where we observe 24 hours and um, then Fourier transform the visibilities with respect to this like angular offset or like over time with respect to M to get what um, Shaw defined as M modes. And we can then expand our beam characteristics like beam uh, times fringes into beam coefficients as well as the expected sky is then the sky temperature expanded also in spherical harmonic basis, which reduces this whole complex three-dimensional interferometric equation into a series of linear equations, which are more tangible to solve. And since these functions are orthonormal, you don't have to solve them on go. You can do it independently. Um, so this method is also called spherical harmonic transit interferometry, where you, um, where the interferometer basically meshes in terms of weighting functions relative to the spherical basis groups by their variance um, over time. Um, so ideally, in order to recover this guy, you would invert the signal by inverting your beam coefficient matrix uh, multiplied by your M modes. But ideally, this is often not possible since you either have too many measurements in relation to your coefficients, which means your system is overdetermined, so you can't invert the matrix because it's not a square matrix, or you lack coverage on part of the sky because even though you might have horizon to horizon fields of view, you can't see specific regions of the sky, which um, either makes your system unenvertible or you get like um, mostly noise out um, if you, for example, try to do a linear least squares approximation. Oh, I think my slides froze. Um, uh, I'll quickly try to. Um, apologies for this. Um, okay, this works again. Um, so instead, you would need to uh, perform some kind of regression, such as Tikhonov regularization, which is done by Eastwood in 2018 with their sky maps with the Owens Valley Long Wavelength Array, um, where you basically put some kind of regressor on your inverse to make sure that you get the desired signal. And additionally, you can do a prior fit on your data, depending on whether or not you're missing specific scales on the sky to recover those scales as well. Um, in terms of spatial scales, you don't uh, you omit like the UV plane altogether. So instead, you need a different metric to see what scales you're sensitive to. Um, the maximum scale is defined by your maximum baseline, of course, and your frequency. Um, but we also developed a metric where you can see like the um, spatial sensitivity in terms of spherical harmonic coefficient space, which we call the spherical harmonic beam coverage. Basically, what we do is we expand the beam transfer function into beam coefficients, sum all the absolute values, and then um, divide it by its maximum to get the relative um, sensitivity or weighting for each mode over all your baselines. So um, a full triangle in this case would mean um, full sensitivity to all the spatial modes, which means you have like full, you measure the true sky. Um, ideally, you would basically see something like this. So you impose fringes on the sky, multiply them with your beam, you decompose them into coefficients. And when you stack them all together, you get something um, like this, where you're only a part of your system has full sensitivity to specific modes and the rest is lacking. Um, so in order to do the imaging, we um, designed Artemis, which we call the All Sky Radio Telescope MO Imaging Suite. Um, where we basically do can do system verification to see if we have any bias in our system. We correct for our data through like flagging and correcting. Then we do the regression and the imaging. And then in the end, we correct for any noise, uh, remove um, side logs through deconvolution and apply weighting if needed. So we use this method on um, 
the engineering development array, uh, low frequency SKA low precursor prototype system. It's a 256 element wide field interferometer with almost 180 degree field of view. Um, we used two 24 hour observations, seven months apart, just to make sure we can remove the sun from our observations. Um, we have a single 926 megahertz uh, uh, kilohertz band at 159.375 megahertz. Um, for this, we only for this sky map we only did the intensity response. We calibrated against the sun because the EDO2 is phase stable for days, and the sun is by far the brightest source in the sky at 159 megahertz in our system. We have two second integration times, which we average to one minute, and our um, like system is relatively homogeneous in beam response. Um, Jones and Waith have shown that um, you only need one component to model the beams and you still get back to around 1% accuracy. Um, so when we look at the spatial scales for the EDA2 with like the distribution of the arrays, um, we do recover sensitivities all the way up to the zeroth order, um, which is really nice, but the zeroth order is very weak in contribution so we do need some kind uh, of fitting to recover that scale. So we can either like insert this component or use a prior to fit this data. Um, and for this paper or like for this kind of, we've done both. Um, in order to do the ticking off or the regression, um, we basically do L-curve fitting, which is an ad hoc method to determine um, your regressor similar to what Eastwood did. And basically what this means is, um, we first take a reduced sample of our array, which includes all the UV spatial scales in our array. And then we run this 2000 times for different values of epsilon until we get like an optimal value, which should end up somewhere in the knee. So this plot you see is basically the lower part of this L curve. And then we sample this linear regime where our solution significantly improves, but our error not that much, uh, becomes not much worse. And um, we coarsely sample this another 200 times for the full array. And then we get like our value for the full array basically, which then again generates its own L curve where the 0 0.1 is in the knee. Um, then for the imaging, we basically insert the beam coefficients. We generate the M modes based on our 24 hour observations. We insert the um, Tikhonov factor. We include the prior. And because we are really asensitive to the zero or the mouth, only like a few percent, um, we opted to remove the zero order coefficients from our um, regression because otherwise our regression would like not converge and we would get like really big negative values in our sky map. So this gives us a set of dirty images um, basically. Um, and um, before we do any further like cleaning and enhance, on them, we first want to make sure there's no bias or um, noise in there that's unwanted. So for the bias, we basically take a sourced map, um, the same map as the prior, but with sources in them, we scale it down to our frequency, we um, convolve it with a full width half max of our system to make sure it's at the same angular scales. And then we feed it through our system with the exact same parameters as our actual sky map. And then we get like a resulting image out, which is slightly different than the input. So if you then remove the inputs and divide by it, you basically divide out, out the true sky and you basically get a weighting that's a metric of the bias in your system, which is mostly introduced by the ticking off regularization because you always invoke bias to reduce your overall error. And this is our bias for the X and Y polarizations. And the nice thing is because this is only a metric of bias and our true sky is removed, we can use this as a kind of weighting where we basically take our sky and um, use this weighting to correct for the large scales. And this is basically a dipole component we're missing. So we should actually could also have removed the dipole component in our regression. Um, additionally, what we do is we also um, determine the amount of noise in our sky maps. Basically we take the visibilities um, we subtract the odd from the even time samples to get the variance on our visibilities, which gives us some metric of noise, and then push this through a system with the exact same parameters. And then we get these sky maps. And you see like a lot of striping. Um, Eastwood saw the same in his sky maps. And this is basically an effect of having terrestrial noise or stationary noise that propagates through a system that doesn't move along with the sky. And it smears out through your sky map. 
is only manifest in the M0 and M1 modes generally. So basically what we do is we isolate those modes and subtract them from our sky modes. Um, and on the left, it shows the removed stationary or terrestrial noise. And then the residual thermal noise in our system is on the right. There are still some artifacts in the thermal noise. Um, like um, you see like a streak at around our Senate pointing, which is most likely either a DC component that manifests in our, manifests in our Senate, or it's a source that's just an interferer. And there's like some vertical structure, which is a small blip in our um, September visibilities, which we couldn't remove because the gap would be too big and it's manifested in all the baselines. Um, the positive though, is only around one Kelvin uh, in total. So it's like really uh, not that much for our sky maps, which is a good sign. Um, Eastwood has also shown that we can generate PSFs by taking point sources on the sky push them through our system uh, with our beam transfer functions, and then we get a PSF out. And since we have this rotational invariant, since a like a movement over LST is a shift by your spherical money component M, we can basically take a centered PSF and rotate it in a longitude or right ascension um, to the place where we want to deconvolve. So we only do image-based deconvolution where we iteratively deconvolve. And if you compare it to a source that's actually on the side lobes that are actually on the source, we own, we see like a systematic error of 0.001%. So we deem that as acceptable for our sky maps. Two minutes um, remaining. So, okay, thanks. So this gives us two um, sky maps with still the sun in there because it's um, resolved. So we couldn't clean it out. So we do waiting on the sky maps to remove it. And then we get our final sky maps without a prior and with a prior. So um, this is our fractional difference between the two. So the prior clearly um, increases the diffuse emission around the galactic plane. So that's some emission we seem to be missing in our um, observations. And then we compare it to different models, uh, primarily the GSM, the 2008, 2016, the SMF and the low free sky survey from DAO. In the GSM, we're mostly brighter by 15 to 25% in both. We have less emission around the galactic plane. This is a similar feature we saw in the low frequency sky maps by Jay's Dowell. And this is most likely in effect due to the fact that the global sky model was made from high frequencies mostly. Um, when we compare to Haslam, um, which is important because we don't want to replicate Haslam, of course, we see that um, we are in accordance with diffuse emission. There are still differences. We are uh, less bright around the collective plane though. And when we compare to the low um, frequency sky survey, we're mostly in accordance with them with only around 4% difference um, to their sky maps with the prior in there, which is um, good. We do see a consistent lesser brightness around our galactic plane, which is around the Southern um, like declinations where most of these sky maps uh, stop having sensitivity. So we definitely think this is a feature in our sky maps since we don't see it in our bias. So that's interesting. Um, we also generated the spectral index relative to the HESA map, which seems to be consistent with what we would expect. So it's mostly on 2.6, 2.65 with less spectral index around the galactic plane with 2.4. Um, and yeah, these are, uh, these are our final sky maps. So we have a non prior fit one and a prior fit one. Um, the paper is currently submitted and under review. And um, these are some uh, statistics uh, on our sky map. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Uh, great talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, Joseph Lazio, can you unmute me? Yep, you, you can hear me? Yep. Uh, yes. Yes, hi, uh, neat work. I, uh, I apologize if you said this and I missed it. Do you have a sense of what the absolute calibration of, of this map is? Yeah, so in terms of um, absolute calibration in this sense, it's a bit tricky um, given that we needed to apply some ad hoc regression methods to um, 
do this work. So I'm currently working on an improvement where we use Bayesian regression instead where you can actually get like proper error bar handles on it. In terms of like what you would expect from the visibilities, the gain calibrations all seem to match the expected temperature of the bright sources we saw in the sky. So we don't expect any huge deviations, but we can't for 100% certainty tell what the absolute calibration is on the sky map. So we can't tell the relative like variance compared to other maps. Um, but yeah, that's still something we're working on by taking multiple frequencies and then we can say a bit more about that. Okay, thanks. Any other last minute questions? Okay, if not, uh, then thanks Mike, thanks all the other speakers for the talks today. And uh, we can move the discussion on the gather thumb.